gotten something that they've wished to acquire from me yet. It'll be in the mail soon enough. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about your level of comprehension as far as what is happening in Admiralty in the uh, court system, the Article 1, Section 8 venues. All right? And one of the things that I have learned from Mr. Anonymous is in Admiralty, the only way to prevail in Admiralty, and this is coming from a very learned man, is confession and avoidance. And I'm just like, that just, Mr. Anonymous, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around it. He says, because you're limiting your mind to be able to think outside the box. Because you believe the confession and avoidance uh, that you're admitting to a wrong that would possibly lead to a tort action by somebody else for trespass. Well, yeah. I mean, naturally, you walk into a venue and you say, well, uh, I, I'm guilty of the facts, but not of the charges. Just seems so benign, you know. So he stressed to me that the only way that you can prevail in admiralty is confession and avoidance. I agree to the facts, but I don't accept the charges. The charges, ladies and gentlemen, are that of a commercial nature. And when something is charged up, it has to be discharged. Okay? Just like a battery. You charge it up and then you use the battery and the charge goes away. So, in Admiralty, uh, it's confession and avoidance. So again, I agree to the facts, but I do not accept or agree with the charges. And then you do your negative affirmant or, or uh, you know, your conditional acceptance on top of that to compound it. Um, and I'll accept the charges provided that you can prove your claim that uh, I fall within Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, Clause 13, 14, 17, um, that I am, in fact, a... a uh, officer of the court, an officer of the government, or that I've held political office. And you combine me with your legislation. Okay? And a lot of people get misconstrued. They think these questions are for the judge. And so often, the alleged ministerial administrator from the bench will attempt to answer the questions. Well, it's not for them to answer. It's for the opposing side, the alleged plaintiff, right? So we have these things called uh, uh, rogatories, interrogatories. It's a series of questions that must be answered to grant rise to the plaintiff having standing, okay? In order to have standing in a court, even an admiralty, the plaintiff must be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they sustained harm, uh, loss, or damage, okay? we got some U.S. Supreme Court cases that uh, are very clear that the state cannot proclaim to be an injured party, okay? Because the state is in a one-dimensional world. It only exists on paper. It's a figment of man's imagination. You are multi-dimensional, whereas the state is, at best, two-dimensional, okay? When you realize that the state has no standing, you can move to strike any evidence that would be presented against you in the court, or against your estate in the court, based upon the fact that the plaintiff has not made a general appearance before this court sworn and independently bonding this case, okay? No real party of interest has made, uh, made a general appearance nor a special appearance before this court 
and I believe none exists. So you want the real party of interest to show up. And the other issue is in an action all parties must be identified, not shall be identified, must be identified. So although there's a man or a woman proclaiming to represent the state, a fictitious entity no more real than Chris Kringle or the Easter Bunny, we see no evidence that the state has sworn to the pleadings. Pleadings are defective if they're not sworn to. Under the pains and penalties of perjury, facing one year in jail and a $10,000 fine. The state can't be incarcerated because the state doesn't have any cognitive function, doesn't have a heartbeat, a pulse, or a soul. And I will challenge any lawyer to produce to the contrary. Won't happen. All right? So what exactly are they doing? when they bring claim based upon some agent and agency uh, observation, an officer of law alleging that you've done something that has caused the state harm, damage, and loss. Well, they're falsifying a record, ladies and gentlemen. They're bringing fraud into the court. Those are unsworn, uh, unsworn declarations or statements of fact they haven't been sworn to properly before a notary. So we always want to see the verified pleadings. What is a verified pleading? If you know what a verified pleading is, go ahead and put it in the chat and help your brothers and sisters comprehend what I'm talking about. All right? A verified pleading is a statement made under the pains and penalties of perjury, facing one year in jail and a $10,000 fine before an officer of the court. A notary, ladies and gentlemen, is in fact an officer of the court. And when you study notaries and what it takes to become a notary, you will quickly find that they have to be in good standing, with no outstanding debts, uh, and it's not no outstanding debts. Let me redact that last statement. They have to be in good standing and, and not uh, be uh, in default or have bad credit okay they have to be somebody in the community who is trustworthy um, who has been authorized by the secretary of state which is in fact an extension of the secretary of states or the office of secretary of state okay and they are an officer of the court so when you're facing these criminal proceedings that are really civil proceedings it is important to draw the attention that no verified pleadings have been brought before the court uh, granting this court subject matter jurisdiction or in personam jurisdiction and territorial jurisdiction has not yet been established on the record. You see those Article 1, Section 8 courts, ladies and gentlemen, stem from Washington, D.C., which is a private for-profit corporation. They call it a, a sovereign city-state, but it is not the 51st state of the United States. It is single and a separate entity. Now, there are people that tell me, Derek, it's 64 square miles. There are others that are telling me, Derek, it's 10 square miles. I don't give a shit if it's 1,500 fucking square miles. The point I am making here is you are outside their territorial jurisdiction where the statutes and codes are, are applicable. And you are not, and have never been furthermore, an officer of the court or, uh, or a uh, um, elected by the people as a public official, and you are independent and sovereign of what they're doing.
They have to prove that those statutes, codes, city ordinances, rules and regulations apply to you. It is not good enough to just say they apply because they apply. All right? I'm not 12 anymore. It's not my old man telling me to go to bed because I said so. And rightfully so, he had the right to say that because it was his roof and his rules and he paid the bills and I was within his territory, right? So we abide and we listen to our folks because, well, they provide the ends and the means. They are the end all be all as we grow up. <clears throat> to help you put this into perspective, what man has a right to tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it? Just point them out to me. Because if you believe that they have that authority over you, far be it for me to educate you to the contrary, okay? It's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to help the people who understand that I don't have any more rights than you do. And if you and I don't have any more rights than each other do, then a group of men or a body of politic certainly do not have any more rights than the both of us, all right? Which means if I don't have the power to compel you to steal from my neighbor, a group of men do not have the power to steal from my neighbors, my friends, my family, and the community based upon the fact that they agree that they have the power to do it, all while subverting from the fact that we the people are the ones who have actually put them in a position to safeguard and protect our freedoms, liberties, and rights. Period. That's their job. And to ensure that their agents and agency don't ever egregiously encroach upon our freedoms, liberties, and rights, there were statutes and, and ordinances and codes put in place by the legislators as well as Congress to ensure that they didn't. However, over a series of years, 150, 160 years, it's all been perverted 180 degrees the opposite, okay? And people actually believe that somehow these people, government, have the ability to control their life decisions. And it couldn't be further from the truth. <clears throat> so we covered standing, what it takes to have standing, sworn pleading, sworn to under the pains and penalties of perjury, claiming harm, damage, or loss. Um, let's talk about warrant of attorney. A prosecuting attorney must have a contract between his client and himself to represent that injured party. Otherwise, he is bringing a falsified claim, he or she is bringing a falsified claim under the false and fictitious pretenses of a uh, false and fictitious unregistered assumed business name, right? That's fraud upon the court. So I want to know, that's really pretty, <clears throat> where the warrant of attorney is on behalf of the prosecutor or attorney to represent named plaintiff, all right? I want to see it produced for on the official record. Now here's something else James Bethel and Mr. Anonymous pointed out in my last uh, trial. There are a lot of people proclaiming to be agents and agency. And as they both exclaimed, Derek, how didn't you catch it? I go, catch what? That's all presumption and assumption. Nothing has been substantiated on the record, aside from the fact that you have people claiming to be agents of the government, but nobody put their oath of office on public record for inspection into the court case. Nobody put their credentials into the court case. Nobody put their oath of office into the court case. Nobody put their bonds into the court case. Derek, effectively what you have is nothing more than hearsay in that court. Nobody verified who they were and substantiated it with facts and evidence, okay? And so often going through these court cases, uh, people get a little discombobulated. It happens very fast. And when you know what you're doing, the 
man or woman sitting on a bench will try to expedite the process because they don't want you bringing it out in the public. So I want the warrant of attorney. Where did he get the authority to operate outside a 10 square mile area? All right. Who summons him to the land that I currently am on? And where did he get his authority? Somebody had to color him with the authority to come out of Washington, D.C., a 10 square mile area. So that's where all these agents and agency belong. That's where they're supposed to be. They'll never produce that record. The court case should be dismissed for a frivolous claim being made for which relief cannot be granted. All right? Um, the fact that they're using false and fictitious misnomers to bring a claim is fraud upon the court. This case should be dismissed for fraud being brought upon the court. Claim should also be dismissed for uh, insufficient pleadings, defective pleadings. Okay. Now, to prove my point, if I was to bring claim like these people bring claim, my claim would be dismissed for a frivolous claim for which relief cannot be granted. If I brought unsworn uh, declaration of facts to a court wanting to sue Tweety Bird or Pinocchio on behalf of Chris Kringle, they would dismiss my case immediately. Let's say I was to bring a case on behalf of Pinocchio and they would immediately want my power of attorney to represent Pinocchio. I want their power of attorney put on record. They need a power of attorney to represent a man, a woman, or an entity. Bring forward your warrant of attorney, your power of attorney to represent your client and produce the contract and how much they paid you. All right. I also want to know where your client works what their address is, what their phone number is, because due process of law was violated, wherein you were not permitted to have their information so that you could provide remedy on the private side. And in fact, instead of providing remedy on the private side, they expedited their position and rammed you right into their, their Article 1, Section 8 militarized court to fleece you, all right? And this is just some of what we're going to be covering in class on the 12th of March. And I'd encourage you guys all to join. Because although I will be covering CPS, child abductions, human trafficking, and uh, child support, we will be getting into much more. Blind adhesion contracts, um... We'll be getting into federal rules of civil procedure. We'll be getting into bar grievances, uh, judicial misconduct, canon laws for which the judge is bound by. Uh, we'll be showing you contract law. So there'll be a lot to gain, even if you are not involved with CPS or the court system pertaining to um, child support, all right? Don't let the, the, the class focal point uh, deter you from joining and gaining some knowledge. It is better to be proactive than reactive. So even though you may not have an issue right now, freedom isn't free. And the best thing you can do for your friends, your families, your neighbors, and your community is become educated. We're going to be going after their bonds, okay? And we've been having a, a very uh, good time running down these people like dogs, chasing their, their sureties that hold the bonds, that can liquidate the bonds, okay? There's too much corruption going on not to stand up and do something. Bringing suit so often fails. But structuring a claim properly to be presented to the insurance company we are finding is, is turning huge results, massive results, okay? And the county boards are involved in this. They're involved in a RICO racketeering scheme. Uh, 
with the promise of financial gain for their principal for which their retirements and pensions are paid from, okay? So they're implemented in human trafficking for profit for the guarantee of federal grant funding and they're waging war on the American people. I think it's imperative for people to understand that the Bar Association created all the provisions for the Title IV D, Title IV E program, which means it is a clear and cut conflict of interest for anybody to attempt to hire a lawyer in order to get their offspring back from CPS uh, <clears throat> through DHHS and the court system. It's very important that people comprehend that. It's it's not plausible and people go well I, I I went through the gamut I went through the system Derek and I got my kids back after how long two years three years a year and a half how many days does it take for you to get cleared from these satanic bastards that are unjustly enriching themselves taking your property under false and fictitious pretenses right I am reading through a case right now and I am just absolutely blown away there's three of us working on it and the details that are coming out a bunch of unverified unsworn statements being made that aren't put in affidavits that completely uh, contradict the 30 or 40 other CPS agents that are involved they're all saying different stuff and yet somehow magically the court the judge sitting on the bench which violates the separation of powers clause comes to a conclusion that these 30 people are correct and yet not a one of them agrees well in law when you have two or more witnesses but none of them agree you can't substantiate a claim if your witnesses are not all in agreement as to what they saw and can articulate it the same then effectively you can't move the case all the witnesses are are discredited because nobody saw the same thing nobody's articulating even close to the same story and because of that your case falls apart right however when you have two or more witnesses that all saw the same thing and are willing to testify with first second-hand and third-hand knowledge as to what they saw and it's all the same or similar then you have grounds for an affirmative offense or defense, depending on, on what game you're playing here. What we are finding with CPS is they are making up information, which would be called falsifying a record, to unjustly enrich their principal, which would violate Title 15, 1692E, Title 1578FF, false and fictitious statements. All right? They're slandering and defaming people's character with unsubstantiated, unsworn statements. Which means that if you went and put them under deposition and they tell a different story than what their statement is, then you can conclusively prove through deposition that they falsified a record in order to unjustly enrich themselves. They lied, which caused you a hardship. It's a trespass. They trespass against you by falsifying a record causing you a harm. And that harm is the fact that you don't have your offspring anymore, which grants rise to a tort claim. But before you go through the, the rigmarole of doing a tort claim, it might be wise, as Mr. Anonymous says, to go through the process of small claims court for breach of trust violation of their good faith bond and oath right to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me god i'm gonna give these uh, affirmation statements of fact and they are true uh and so when you get them into a position where you get them in the small claims court if you're trying to get your offspring back this is what mr anonymous is saying oh yeah derek you can use deposition and that's a good idea if you're going to bring a future claim against the bond uh it would give you some solid grounds for them to consider whether or not they just want to cut you a check or whether or not they want to take you into the court um but he said the true argument is arguing through title not against it 
to bring your property back, right? They 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 are in in constructive possession of your property, your RNA, your DNA, uh, your property granted to you by the Heavenly Father, not even granted to you by them. Where do they get the right to take something that doesn't belong to them, that they didn't grant in the first place? They didn't grant you the authority to feed and breed. They didn't grant you the offspring. But they're taking something that doesn't belong to them. All right? And that's theft by taking. Uh, if, if they're in receivership of that property, that's uh, theft by receiving. Okay? They're in possession of stolen property. And people go, well, Derek, you talk about offspring like that, it sounds pretty bad. The reality of it is, without property, you don't have rights, and without rights, you don't have property. That property was gifted to you by the Heavenly Creator. And whether you believe in the Heavenly Creator or not makes no difference to me. That property can be proven to be yours through DNA, RNA, uh, saliva. It took 50% of you and 50% of your partner to create that property, period, end of story. And nobody else on this earth is entitled to your property based on their false and fictitious claims and statements. Let's be real. How often does CPS spend with your offspring? They come to a house, do a five to six minute evaluation. They're not even cleared for making an evaluation on habitation within the household. What education do they have to make that kind of uh, assessment? Are they a former contractor? Do they know what black mold is? Do they understand what termite damage is? Do they crawl underneath your, your crawl space? Do they look for lead paint? Are they authorized to inspect the plumbing and the electrical in the house? No. So how is it that these courts find that the opinion of these jackasses, these undereducated morons, how, do they, how does the court find that their assessment is true, accurate, and substantiated? They don't. They side with them because they're guaranteed grant money for doing so. So I look forward to seeing you guys on the uh, 12th of March. Um, again, the class will be geared towards child support and uh, child abduction, human trafficking, kidnapping. And it's just not happening with our youth. It's happening with our elders. And it's been happening with our elders for quite some time. Where the state comes in, forces them into a nursing home where they can liquidate the assets of the elder. All right? That's theft, ladies and gentlemen. Every man has a right to be free, unimpeded, and, and free meaning not bound by the legal constraints of another, all right? You have a choice. You don't have to be forced or uh, uh, coerced into allowing these assholes to steal what you've earned your entire life. There's a gal, she's down in Texas, she's a millionaire, and the state is forcing her right now, attempting to force her into a nursing home. And they have seized her bank accounts, saying that she is mentally Incompetent, And I'm thinking to myself, you're worth $12 million. You don't want to hire a lawyer because you don't trust a lawyer. That makes sense to me. And because you won't hire a lawyer, they court appoints you a lawyer, and then they seize your bank accounts and purport to be the power of attorney, in fact, for your estate now. And now they're going to put you in a shitty-ass nursing home and liquidate your estate. The lawyers have already stolen $500,000 from her. 500 fucking grand in eight months they've taken from her. What in the fucking world could they have possibly done to earn $500,000 in the last six to eight months? Does any of that make sense to you guys? Because it sure the fuck don't make any sense to me. They're saying they're administering her estate on her behalf and they're blocking her family, who she wishes to give power of attorney to, they're blocking her family from being able to do that because now they're claiming that she's of unsound mind and not, not clairvoyant enough to make a proper decision on her estate. That's the kind of shit that we're up against. So with that said, I hope to see you guys March 12th, uh, 2022 at 12 p.m. Central Time, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Standard Pacific Time. And uh, we're going to do a class, and it will be geared 
uh, towards child support, towards uh, human trafficking, the trafficking of children, to help you guys uh, fight a fight that rightfully we shouldn't even have to fight. CPS, DHHS, the whole lot of them should be abolished. Uh, they should all be put in cages at this point for what they're doing, uh, causing harm, strife, damage, loss uh, to the, the, the people that they're trespassing against. And I want to see that through by helping you guys understand how to be, bring a claim against their bonds and follow through with it. Not just make a claim, but follow through with the son of a bitch. Because making a claim and then you get your offspring back and you drop the claim and three weeks later they come back and scoop your kid up again, let's not give them that option. Make that claim and make it fucking stick. That's the name of the game. You cry wolf too many times, they're just going to run roughshod over you all the time and never take you seriously. Stick it to them. You want to get put on a do not detain list, leave that motherfucker alone? Stick it to them one or two good times and trust me, the last thing they want is your mouth coming out of their, or your name coming out of their mouth. I promise you that. All right? That's a fucking guarantee. So, <clears throat> you got malicious prosecution. We've got all kinds of different things that we're going to cover. Uh, it's never going to make sense. The government is here to fuck us seven ways from Sunday. That's correct. And that's exactly what they do. But it's important to understand blind, blind adhesion contracts and how to navigate with your paperwork to get these people to do the right thing. And realistically, we're all raised and told, don't touch something that doesn't belong to you, uh, keep your hands to yourself, things of that nature. We, for the most part, the American people do that. Uh, and the people that are alleged to be honorable, are quite, they got sticky fingers. Sticky fingers and slick fucking forked tongues. And they are good at what they do, fleecing the American people and nobody getting upset about it. Or the people getting upset about it, not becoming unified to stick it to them. So let's get unified. Let's start tracking down their bonds. Let's start getting them to produce their oaths of office on the record. Let's hold them to their oath of office and accept their oath of office and acknowledge it. That way when they come outside the law and they're in breach of trust, you can nail their ass. How do you get the officer's bond number? Well. That's what we're going to cover in class. There are multiple bonds out there. Uh, the constitutions of every state, as well as the United States, all require a bond before the oath of office is taken. Okay, They're supposed to be independently bonded. Um, and that's a law. And then they statutorily provide provisions that state, well, if you don't get them independently bonded, you can be covered by a blanket bond. Well, that blanket bond still doesn't abscond from the fact that they don't fill their office because they were negligent in taking office by not having their bond in place first. It is a prerequisite. Before they take their oath of office, a bond must be put in place. Okay. And once the bond's in place, because we know that the bond has to be created, there also must be a power of attorney to the bonding agent as surety to be able to liquidate or make an assessment on the claims being presented. So there's also a power of attorney that we want. All this is going to be covered in the in the class on the 12th. Uh, again, March 12th, 2022, 12 p.m. Central Time, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time. So. I'll, I'll post the link up above. You guys can donate. And uh, for the class, it's always $100. I had a buddy recently pay $7,500 to somebody. You are law, exactly. $7,500. And what he has shown me, I am disappointed in TJ. And I don't talk shit about too many people out there trying to help others. But for $7,500, what this guy sent me, I was like, wow. Um, hmm. We got more done in eight hours than they sent you for 7,500 bucks. That's crazy. That's crazy. We got more done in an eight hour session uh, than you got in value for $7,500. And some of the information that was disseminated to him, uh, there's information missing. Like when you're talking about secured party creditor, it's not secured party creditor, it's secured party and creditor. You're talking about filing something in the uh, commercial chamber with a UCC-1 and a UCC-3 addendum, all right? 
And if you're not doing a UCC 11 before you do your UCC one to find out if there's somebody first in time, first in line, you're absolutely a fool. And you haven't done your research or your homework, all right? So that that bothers me to no extent. Remember, people, it's not the, the price tag. People think that, oh, if I'm paying 8, 10, 12 grand for a spoon, that spoon probably makes the food taste better. That's not the truth. A free spoon is just, is just as good <coughs> as a $5,000 spoon, in my opinion. It don't make the food taste any better. So when you see these sticker prices of five grand, six grand, eight grand, 10 grand to help you guys, at the end of the day, I want to stress this to you. We're only as good as our weakest link, and you will be the only one in that courtroom sounding off like you got a fucking pair. So it doesn't matter what you spend for other people to provide you guidance. At the end of the day, if you yourself don't comprehend it and understand it, you won't be able to stand on it. And that therein lies the problem. People pay these astronomical sticker prices to get help. And then they get shit all over, worse than a fucking lawyer shits on them. And uh, so don't snide at the fact that it's just $100 for the course, because I put my heart and soul in these things. Um, and I want to make it feasible for everybody to join. So with that said, class March 12, 2022, 12 p.m. Central Time, uh, 1, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and uh, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, we're going to do a class going into contract, uh, predominantly geared towards child support and and uh, child abductions, adoptions through CPS and the defunct alleged court system. So I look forward to seeing you guys. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for joining me. Again, the donation will be $100. We're going to get deep into it. If you join the course, don't be surprised uh, so often when we get into a class that we subvert from the subject matter for a brief time, maybe at the end or the beginning, and we talk about other subject matters. So don't think that because uh, it doesn't necessarily pertain to your uh, predicament at the moment, that it won't entail great information to prepare you for what you're going through currently. Remember, preventative maintenance is so much better than uh, trying to fix this, uh, the problem after it's already developed. So preventative maintenance is the best thing to, um, to practice, all right? We want to get in there and we want to be proactive versus reactive. In a reactive world, you're already behind the ball. You're already taking in the shorts, and it's really, really hard under stress to gain this knowledge and be able to stand on it affirmatively uh, when you've got the loaded shotgun to your head and they're torturing you by threat, duress, and coercion of taking your offspring, zeroing out your bank account, so on and so forth. I don't have all the answers, so I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, we have prevailed in a number of different court cases pertaining to from child support to bank fraud uh, to zeroing out credit cards. That's all water under the bridge as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've, we've been involved in things where some of the paperwork we've done in the past did not prevail, where in other times it did prevail, so I'm not telling you that I have the silver bullet, that I know exactly what's going on, and if you follow this process, it will work. I am not telling you that at all. What I am telling you is the knowledge that you will have gained will give you the ability to stand up and sound off like you have a pair, and in your heart will make sense to you why you're doing it and what you could do in an appeal situation if you follow it. So we're always setting ourselves up for an appeal because the lower courts and the child support courts and all these courts are always going to make piss poor decisions to unjustly enrich themselves. That's the way the system is rigged. Okay. Then you get to the appellate level and they're going to be looking at your substantive rights. Uh, let's talk about substantive rights real quick while we're here. So, substantive rights would be like your right to due process of law. Well, what constitutes due process of law? Full disclosure, uh, your right to deposition, your right to face the accuser, uh, uh, um, your right to inspect the documents. That's all uh, substantive rights, all right? Those are substantive rights. And your substantive rights continually get violated day in and day out in the court system. And there's this little thing called an interlocutory appeal. 
Now they tell you, you can't do an appeal without a brief because there's been no ruling in this court yet. Well, that's all cockamamie horse shit. I'm here to tell you right now, that's complete and utter bullshit. Because you can do an appeal on substantive rights in the middle of a case. You can file for an injunctive relief in the middle of your case, okay? Or in the middle of the case, because we know it doesn't pertain to you. Um, but anyway, I'll let you guys go. Thanks for joining me this evening. Thank you for all your guys' support. I've got some work to do. Uh, the computer screen is not quite fixed yet, but we're getting there. And uh, we'll talk to you guys real soon. Thanks again for all your support. Will you also go over divorce? Yeah, divorce is pretty simple. Divorce is really simple. You guys entered into an agreement privately without the government being there, and you can part ways without the government being there, so long as you can be civil about it and create a contract and terms and agreement that you both agree to, and you can walk away without losing half of your shit to lawyers, because that's what's going to happen. First thing a lawyer does, any good lawyer, which there aren't good lawyers, that's an oxymoron, any lawyer who's really good at fucking people, the first thing he does is he goes in and he checks your credit, and he looks at all your assets, and he does a calculation on how long he can make this court case, this divorce case, last, so he can steal the better three quarters of everything you two have ever earned in your fucking life. Then when he feels he's done a sufficient job of it, you will find that both attorneys on both sides of the divorce will go, you know what, we finally found some common ground here. We're going to agree that this is the way you guys should part ways. Oh, and by the way, here's our bill. Here's our bill. After you guys separate everything, we've got, we're entitled to three quarters of everything that you ever thought you fucking owned. That's how divorce works in the United States of America. Back in the day, a divorce was very uncommon, but even being uncommon, a divorce didn't last typically longer than a fucking month. Nowadays, they last up to 10 years, depending on what your asset net, net value is worth. So there's something, there's some food for thought. If you're going to get a divorce, maybe it's time to sit down amicably with your uh, significant other and say, let's part ways amicably without dragging a bunch of lying, looting, pandering, thieving fucking lawyers into our business who are going to liquidate our 401ks, liquidate our credit, liquidate our assets, and take away from our offspring. Because at the end of the day, these people feed on controversy. That's what they feed off of. And... Uh, there's a number of people that I talked to that were multimillionaires when they went in for a divorce and when they came out, they were left with nothing, not a fucking thing. And that's not an exaggeration. And then that wasn't even the worst of it. Then child support got involved and they were homeless by the time it was all said and done. We're talking about people who used to have exotic cars, three or four really nice houses that actually in the middle of their separation gave their wife one of the houses and cars that were paid off. The woman didn't need or want for nothing. It was taken care of. And they still liquidated his entire estate. So keep that uh, in mind. Um, you can do a, a common law separation. You can come to terms and agreement and separate, and you don't need the, the government, the lawyers, to come in there and, and argue for you and create controversy where otherwise none exists. And the judge has to agree. If the two parties agree to the, the separation terms and conditions, and you go before the magistrate and say, this is what we agreed upon, sign it, they got no fucking choice. And if they don't sign it, then they're in breach of their fiduciary duties, and you should join the class to figure out how you can collapse their bonds. So we'll see you guys March 12, 2022, uh, 12 p.m. Central Time. Thanks again for joining me. Appreciate all the love, and we'll talk to you real soon.